Preface Three Sunsets and Other Poems by Lewis Carroll. Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Nearly the whole of this volume is a reprint of the serious portion of Phantasmagoria and Other Poems, which was first published in 1869 and has long been out of print the path of roses was written soon after the crimean war when the name of florence nightingale had already become a household word only a woman's hair was suggested by a circumstance mentioned in the life of dean swift viz that after his death a small packet was found among his papers containing a single lock of hair and inscribed with those words after three days was written after seeing holman hunt's picture the finding of christ in the temple the two poems far away and a song of love are reprinted from sylvie and bruno and sylvie and bruno concluded books whose high price made necessary by the great cost of production has i fear put them out of the reach of most of my readers a lesson in latin is reprinted from the jabberwock a magazine got up among the members of the girls latin school boston u s a the only poems here printed for the first time are put together under the title of puck lost and found having been inscribed in two books fairies a poem by allingham illustrated by miss e gertrude thompson and mary elves a story book by whom written i do not know illustrated by c o murray which were presented to a little girl and boy as a sort of memento of a visit paid by them to the author one day, on which occasion he taught them the pastime, dear to the hearts of children, of folding paper pistols, which can be made to imitate fairly well the noise of a real one. January 1898 End of Preface This recording is in the public domain. Three Sunsets by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi Three Sunsets He saw her once, and in the glance, A moment's glance of meeting eyes, His heart stood still, in sudden trance, He trembled with a sweet surprise. All in the waning light she stood, The star of perfect womanhood that summer eve his heart was light with lighter step he trod the ground and life was fairer in his sight and music was in every sound he blessed the world where there could be so beautiful a thing as she there once again as evening fell and stars were peering overhead two lovers met to bid farewell the western sun gleamed faint and red lost in a drift of purple cloud that wrapped him like a funeral shroud long time the memory of that night the hand that clasped the lips that kissed the form that faded from his sight slow sinking through the tearful mist in dreamy music seemed to roll through the dark chambers of his soul so after many years he came a wanderer from a distant shore the street the house were still the same but those he sought were there no more his burning words his hopes and fears unheeded fell on alien ears only the children from their play would pause the mournful tale to hear shrinking in half alarm away or step by step would venture near to touch with timid curious hands that strange wild man from other lands he sat beside the busy street there where he last had seen her face and thronging memories bitter sweet seemed yet to haunt the ancient place her footfall ever floated near her voice was ever in his ear he sometimes as the daylight waned and evening mists began to roll 
in half soliloquy complained of that black shadow on his soul and blindly fanned with cruel care the ashes of a vain despair the summer fled the lonely man still lingered out the lessening days still as the night drew on would scan each passing face with closer gaze till sick at heart he turned away and sighed she will not come to-day so by degrees his spirit bent to mock its own despairing cry in stern self-torture to invent new luxuries of agony and people all the vacant space with the visions of her perfect face then for a moment she was nigh he heard no step but she was there as if an angel suddenly were bodied from the viewless air and all her fine ethereal frame should fade as swiftly as it came so half in fancy's sunny trance and half in misery's aching void with sad and stony countenance his bitter being he enjoyed and thrust for ever from his mind the happiness he could not find as when the wretch in lonely room to selfish death is madly hurled the glamour of that fatal fume shuts out the wholesome living world so all his manhood's strength and pride one sickly dream had swept aside yea brother and we passed him there but yesterday in merry mood and marvelled at the lordly air that shamed his beggar's attitude nor heeded that ourselves might be wretches as desperate as he who let the thought of bliss denied make havoc of our life and powers and pine in solitary pride for peace that never shall be ours because we will not work and wait in trustful patience for our fate and so it chanced one more that she came by the old familiar spot the face he would have died to see bent o'er him and he knew it not too wrapped in selfish grief to hear even when happiness was near and pity filled her gentle breast for him that would not stir to speak the dying crimson of the west that faintly tinged his haggard cheek fell on her as she stood and shed a glory round the patient head ah let him wake the moments fly this awful tryst may be the last and see the tear that dimmed her eye had fallen on him ere she passed she passed the crimson pale to grey and hope departed with the day the heavy hours of night went by and silence quickened into sound and lights lit up the eastern sky and life began its daily round but light and life for him were fled his name was numbered with the dead november 1861 end of poem this recording is in the public domain the path of roses by lewis carroll read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. The Path of Roses In the dark silence of an ancient room, whose one tall window fronted to the west, where, through laced tendrils of a hanging vine, the sunset glow was fading into night, sat a pale lady, resting weary hands upon a great clasped volume, and her face within her hands. Not as in rest she bowed, but large hot tears were coursing down her cheek, and her low panted sobs broke awfully upon the sleeping echoes of the night. Soon she unclasped the volume once again, and read the words in tone of agony, as in self-torture, weeping as she read. He crowns the glory of his race, he prayeth, but in some fit place to meet his foeman face to face 
and battling for the true the right from ruddy dawn to purple night to perish in the midmost fight where hearts are fierce and hands are strong where peals the bugle loud and long where blood is dripping in the throng still with a dim and glazing eye to watch the tide of victory to hear in death the battle cry then gathered grandly to his grave to rest among the true and brave in holy ground where yew trees wave where from church windows sculptured fair float out upon the evening air the note of praise the voice of prayer where no vain marble mockery insults with loud and boastful lie the simple soldier's memory where sometimes little children go and read in whispered accent slow the name of him who sleeps below her voice died out like one in dreams she sat alas she sighed what can woman do her life is aimless and her death unknown hemmed in by social forms she pines in vain man has his work but what can woman do an answer came there from the creeping gloom the creeping gloom that settled into night peace for thy lot is other than a man's his is a path of thorns he beats them down he faces death he wrestles with despair thine is of roses to adorn and cheer his lonely life and hide the thorns in flowers she spake again in bitter tone she spake ay as a toy the puppet of an hour or a fair posy newly plucked at morn but flung aside and withered ere the night an answer came there from the creeping gloom the creeping gloom that blackened into night so shalt thou be the lamp to light his path what time the shades of sorrow close around and so it seemed to her an awful light pierced slowly through the darkness orbed and grew until all passed away the ancient room the sunlight dying through the trellised vine the one tall window all had passed away and she was standing on the mighty hills beneath around and far as eye could see squadron on squadron stretched opposing hosts ranked as for battle mute and motionless anon a distant thunder shook the ground the tramp of horses and a troop shot by plunged headlong in that living sea of men plunged to their death back from the fatal field a scattered handful fighting hard for life broke through the serried lines but as she gazed they shrank and melted and their forms grew thin grew pale as ghosts when the first morning ray dawns from the east the trumpet's blazoned blare died into silence and the vision passed passed to a room where sick and dying lay in long sad line there brooded fear and pain darkness was there the shade of azrael's wing but there was one that ever to and fro moved with light footfall purely calm her face and those deep steadfast eyes that starred the gloom still as she went she ministered to each comfort and counsel cooled the fevered brow with softest touch and in the listening ear of the pale sufferer whispered words of peace the dying warrior gazing as she passed clasped his thin hands and blessed her bless her too thou who didst bless the merciful of old so prayed the lady watching tearfully her gentle moving onward till the night had veiled her wholly and the vision passed then once again the solemn whisper came so in the darkest path of man's despair where war and terror shake the troubled earth lies woman's mission with unblenching brow to pass through scenes of horror and of fright where men grow sick and tremble unto her all things are sanctified for all are good nothing so mean but shall deserve her care nothing so great but she may bear her part no life is vain 
each hath his place assigned. Do thou thy task, and leave the rest to God. And there was silence, but the lady made no answer, save one deeply breathed, Amen. And she arose, and in that darkening room stood lonely as a spirit of the night, stood calm and fearless in the gathered night, and raised her eyes to heaven. There were tears upon her face, but in her heart was peace, peace that the world nor gives, nor takes away. April 10th, 1856 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Valley of the Shadow of Death by Louis Caro Rats for LibriVox or by Lewis Brander Hark! sat the dying man and sighed to that complaining tone like sprite condemned each eventide to walk the world alone at sunset when the air is still I hear it creep from yonder hill it breathes upon me Death and chill, a moment, and it's gone. My son, it minds me of a day, left half a life behind, that I have prayed to be put away, forever from my mind, but bitter memory will not die. It haunts my soul when none is nigh, I hear its whisper in the sigh of that complaining wind. And now in death my soul is fain, to tell the tale of fear that hidden in my breast has lain through many a weary year, yet time would fail to utter all. The evil spells that held me thrall and thrust my life from four to four, thou needest not to hear. The spells that bound me with a chain, sin's stern behests to do. To pleasure's self invoked in vain, a heavy burden grew, till from my spirit's vivid eye, a hundred thing I seemed to fly, through the dark woods that underline yon mountain range of blue. Deep in those woods I find a veil, no sunlight visits, nor star, nor wandering moonbeam pale, where never comes the breath of summer breeze. There in mine ear, even as I lingered half in fear, I heard a whisper, cold and clear, This is the gate of death. Oh, better is it to abide in weariness alway, At dawn to sigh for eventide, at eventide for day. Thy noon has fled, thy sun has shone, The brightness of thy day is gone. What need to lack and linger on till life be cold and grey? A oh, while well, it said, beneath yon pool, in some still cave and deep, the fevered brain might slumber cool, the eyes forget to weep within that goblet's mystic rim. Are droughts of healing stored for him whose heart is sick, whose sight is dim, who prays but to sleep? The evening breeze went moaning by, like moaner for the dead, and stirred with a chill complaining sigh, the tree tops overhead, my guardian angel seemed to stand and mutely wave a warning hand. With sudden terror all unmanned, I turned myself and fled. A cottage gate stood open wide, soft fell the dying ray. On two fair children side by side that rested from their play, together bent the earnest head, as ever and anon they read. From one dear book the words they said come back to me to day. Like twin cascades on mountain stir, together wandered down the ripples of the golden hair, the ripples of the brown, while through the tangled silken haze. Blue eyes looked forth in eager gaze, more star-like than the gems that blaze about the monarch's crown. My son, there comes to each an hour when sinks the spirit's pride, 
when weary hands forget the power, the strokes of death to guide. In such a moment, warriors say, a word a panic rout made stay, a sudden charge redeemed the day, and turned the living tide. I could not see, for blinding tears, the glories of the west. A heavenly music filled my ears, a heavenly peace my breast. Come unto me, come unto me, O oh, ye that labour unto me, ye heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. The night drew onward, thin and blue, the evening mists arise, to bathe the thirsty land in dew, this earth in paradise. While over silence field and tongue, the deep blue vault of heaven looked down. Not as a boat an angry frown, but bright with angels' eyes. Blessed day, then first I heard the voice that since hath oft beguiled these eyes from tears and speak rejoice, his heart was anguish wild. Thy mother, boy, thou hast not known, so soon she left me here to moan, left me to weep and watch alone. Our beloved child, though parted from my aching sight, like homeward speeding dove, she passed into the perfect light that floods the world above. Yet our twin spirits were I know, though one abide in pain below, love as in summers long ago, and evermore shall love. So it was a glad and patient heart. I moved toward my end. The streams that flow a while apart shall both in ocean blend. I dare not weep. I can but bless a love that pities my distress and lent me in life's wilderness so sweet and true a friend. But if there be, oh, if there be a truth in what they say. The angel forms we cannot see go with us on our way. Then surely she is with me here. I dimly feel her spirit near. The morning mists grow thin and clear, and death brings in the day. April eighteen sixty-eight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Solitude by Lewis Carroll, read for LibriVox.org by Gabby. Solitude. I love the stillness of the wood. I love the music of the rill. I love to couch in pensive mood upon some silent hill. Scars heard beneath yon arching trees, the silver-crested ripples pass. And, like a mimic brook, the breeze whispers among the grass. Here from the world I win release, nor scorn of man nor footstep brood, break in to mar the holy peace of this great solitude. Here may the silent tears I weep lull the vexed spirit into rest, as infants sob themselves to sleep upon a mother's breast. But when the bitter hour is gone, and the keen throbbing pangs are still, O oh sweetest then to couch alone upon some silent hill, to live in joys that once have been, to put the cold world out of sight, and deck life's drear and barren scene with hues of rainbow light. For what to man the gift of breath if sorrow be his lot below, if all the day that ends in death be dark with clouds of woe? Shall the poor transport of an hour repay long years of sore distress, the fragrance of a lonely flower make glad the wilderness? Ye golden hours of life's young spring, of innocence, of love and truth, bright beyond all imagining, Thou fairy dream of youth! I'd give all wealth that years have piled, 
the slow result of life's decay, to be once more a little child for one bright summer day. March 16, 1853 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Far Away by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Far Away He stepped so lightly to the land, all in his manly pride. He kissed her cheek, he clasped her hand, yet still she glanced aside. Too gay he seems, she darkly dreams, too gallant and too gay, to think of me, poor simple me, when he is far away. I bring my love this goodly pearl across the seas, he said, a gem to deck the dearest girl that ever sailor wed. She holds it tight, her eyes are bright, her throbbing heart would say, he thought of me, he thought of me when he was far away. The ship has sailed into the west, her ocean bird is flown, a dull dead pain is in her breast, and she is weak and lone. But there's a smile upon her face, a smile that seems to say, He'll think of me, he'll think of me, when he is far away. Though waters wide between us glide, our lives are warm and near. No distance parts two faithful hearts, two hearts that love so dear. And I will trust my sailor lad, for ever and a day, to think of me, to think of me when he is far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Beatrice by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug In her eyes is the living light of a wanderer to earth from a far celestial height. Summer's five are all the span. Summer's five, since time began to veil in mists of human night a shining angel birth. Does an angel look from her eyes? Will she suddenly spring away and soar to her home in the skies? Beatrice, blessing and blessed to be. Beatrice, still as I gaze on thee, visions of two sweet maids arise whose life was of yesterday of a Beatrice pale and stern, with the lips of a dumb despair, with the innocent eyes that yearn, yearn for the young sweet hours of life, far from sorrow and far from strife, for the happy summers that never return, when the world seemed good and fair. Of a Beatrice, glorious, bright, of a sainted ethereal maid, whose blue eyes are deep fountains of light, cheering the poet that broodeth apart, filling with gladness his desolate heart, like the moon when she shines through a cloudless night on a world of silence and shade. And the visions waver and faint, and the visions vanish away that my fancy delighted to paint. She is here at my side, a living child, with a glowing cheek and the tresses wild, nor death-pale martyr, nor radiant saint, yet stainless and bright as they. For I think, if a grim wild beast were to come from his charnel cave, from his jungle home in the east, stealthily creeping with bated breath, stealthily creeping with eyes of death, he would forget all his dreams of the feast, and crouch at her feet a slave. She would twine her hand in his mane, she would prattle in silvery tone, like the tinkle of summer rain, questioning him with her laughing eyes, questioning him with a glad surprise, till she caught from those fierce eyes again the love that lit her own. And be sure, if a savage heart, in a mask of human guise, were to come on her here apart, bound for a dark and a deadly deed, hurrying past with pitiless speed, he would suddenly falter and guiltily start at the glance of her pure blue eyes. 
Nay, be sure, if an angel fair, a bright seraph undefiled, were to stoop from the trackless air, fain would she linger in glad amaze, lovingly linger to ponder and gaze, with the sister's love and the sister's care, on the happy innocent child. December the 4th, 1862 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stolen Waters by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Alexa B. The light was faint and soft the air that breathed around the place, and she was lithe and tall and fair, and with a wayward grace her queenly head she bare. With glowing cheek, with gleaming eye, she met me on the way. My spirit owned the witchery within her smile that lay. I followed her, I knew not why. The trees were thick with many a fruit, the grass with many a flower. My soul was dead, my tongue was mute in that accursed hour. And in my dream, with silvery voice, she said, or seemed to say, Youth is the season to rejoice. I could not choose but stay. I could not say her nay. She plucked a branch above her head, with rarest fruitage laden. Drink of the juice, Sir Knight, she said. Tis good for knight and maiden. O oh, blind mine eye that would not trace, O oh, deaf mine ear that would not heed, the mocking smile upon her face, the mocking voice of greed. I drank the juice, and straightway fell, a fire within my brain. My soul within me seemed to melt, in sweet delirious pain. Sweet is the stolen draught, she said, hath sweetness not stint or measure? Pleasant the secret hoard of bread, what bars us from our pleasure? Yea, Take we pleasure while we may, I heard myself replying, in the red sunset far away. My happier life was dying, my heart was sad, my voice was gay, and unawares I knew not how, I kissed her dainty fingertips, I kissed her on the lily brow, I kissed her on the false, false lips, that burning kiss, I feel it now. True love gives true love of the best. Then take, I cried, my heart to thee. The very heart from out my breast I plucked, I gave it willingly. Her very heart she gave to me, then died the glory from the west. In the gray light I saw her face, and it was withered old and gray. The flowers were fading in their place, were fading with the fading day. Forth from her like a hunted deer, through all that ghastly night I fled, and still behind me seemed to hear her voice unflagging tread, and scarce drew breath for fear. Yet marked I well how strangely seemed the heart within my breast to sleep. Silent it lay, or so I dreamed, with never a throb or a leap. For hers was now my heart, she said, the heart that once had been mine own and in my breast I bore instead a cold, cold heart of stone. So grew the morning overhead. The sun shot downward through the trees, his old familiar flame. All ancient sounds upon the breeze from copse and meadow came, but I was not the same. They call me mad, I smile, I weep, uncaring how or why. Yea, when one's heart is laid asleep, what better than to die? So that grave be dark and deep. To die? To die? And yet methinks I drink of life to-day, Deep as the thirsty traveller drinks of fountain by the way. My voice is sad, my heart is gay. When yester-eve was on the wane, I heard a clear voice singing, So sweetly that, like summer rain, My happy tears came springing. My human heart returned again. A rosy child, sitting and singing in a garden fair. The joy of hearing, seeing, 
the simple joy of being, or twining rosebuds in the golden hair that ripples free and wild. A sweet pale child, wearily looking to the purple west, waiting the great forever, that suddenly shall sever the cruel chains that hold her from her rest by earth joys unbeguiled. An angel child, gazing with living eyes on a dead face, the mortal form forsaken, that none may now awaken, that lieth painless, moveless in her place, as though in death she smiled. Be as a child, so shalt thou sing for very joy of breath, so shalt thou wait thy dying in holy transport lying, so pass rejoicing through the gate of death in garment undefiled. Then call me what they will, I know, that now my soul is glad. If this be madness, better so, far better to be mad, weeping or smiling as I go. For if I weep it is that now I see how deep a loss is mine, and feel how brightly round my brow the coronal might shine had I but kept mine early vow. And if I smile, it is that now I see the promise of the years, the garland waiting for my brow, that must be one with tears, with pain, with death, I care not how. May ninth, 1862 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Willow Tree by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Willow Tree The morn was bright, the steeds were light, the wedding guests were gay. Young Ellen stood within the wood and watched them pass away. She scarcely saw the gallant train, the teardrop dimmed her ee. Unheard the maiden did complain beneath the willow tree. O oh, Robin, thou didst love me well, till on a bitter day she came the lady isabel and stole thy heart away my tears are vain i live again in days that used to be when i could meet thy welcome feet beneath the willow tree o willow gray i may not stay till spring renew thy leaf but i will hide myself away and nurse a lonely grief it shall not dim life's joy for him my tears he shall not see while he is by i'll come not nigh my weeping willow tree but when i die o oh, let me lie beneath thy loving shade that he may loiter careless by where i am lowly laid and let the white white marble tell if he should stoop to see here lies a maid that loved thee well beneath the willow tree eighteen fifty nine end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Only a Woman's Hair by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Only a Woman's Hair Only a Woman's Hair Fling it aside, a bubble on life's mighty stream he did not man but watch the broadening tide bright with the western beam nay in those words there rings from other years the echo of a long low cry where a proud spirit wrestles with its tears in loneliest agony and as i touch that lock strange visions throng upon my soul with dreamy grace of woman's hair the theme of poet's song in every time and place a child's bright tresses by the breezes kissed to sweet disorder as she flies veiling beneath a cloud of golden mist flushed cheek and laughing eyes or fringing like a shadow raven black the glory of a queen-like face or from a gypsy's sunny brow tossed back in wild and wanton grace or crown-like on the hoary head of age whose tale of life is well-nigh told or last, in dreams I make my pilgrimage to Bethany of old. I see the feast, the purple and the gold, the gathering crowd of Pharisees, whose scornful eyes are centred to behold yon woman 
on her knees. The stifled sob rings strangely on mine ears, wrung from the depth of sin's despair, and still she bathes the sacred feet with tears and wipes them with her hair. He scorned not then the simple loving deed of her, the lowest and the last. Then scorn not thou, but use with earnest heed this relic of the past. The eyes that loved it once no longer wake, so lay it by with reverent care, touching it tenderly for sorrow's sake. It is a woman's hair. February 17th, 1862 End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Sailor's Wife by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug See, there are tears upon her face, Tears newly shed and scarcely dried. Close in an agonised embrace She clasps the infant at her side. Peace dwells in those soft-lidded eyes, those parted lips that faintly smile. Peace, the foretaste of paradise, in heart too young for care or guile. No peace that mother's features wear, but quivering lip and knotted brow, and broken mutterings, all declare the fearful dream that haunts her now. The storm wind, rushing through the sky wails from the depths of cloudy space shrill piercing as the seaman's cry when death and he are face to face familiar tones are in the gale they ring upon her startled ear and quick and low she pants the tale that tells of agony and fear still that phantom ship is nigh with a vexed and lifelike motion all beneath an angry sky rocking on an angry ocean round the straining mast and shrouds throng the spirits of the storm darkly seen through driving clouds bends each gaunt and ghastly form see the good ship yields at last dumbly yields and fights no more driving in the frantic blast headlong on the fatal shore hark i hear her battered side with a low and sullen shock dashed amid the foaming tide full upon a sunken rock his face shines out against the sky like a ghost so cold and white with a dead despairing eye gazing through the gathered night is he watching through the dark where a mocking ghostly hand points a faint and feeble spark glimmering from the distant land sees he in this hour of dread hearth and home and wife and child loved ones who in summers fled clung to him and wept and smiled reeling sinks the fated bark to her tomb beneath the wave must he perish in the dark not a hand stretched out to save see the spirits how they crowd watching death with eyes that burn Waves rush in, she shrieks aloud, ere her waking sense return. The storm is gone, the skies are clear, hushed is that bitter cry of pain. The only sound that meets her ear, the heaving of the sullen main. Though heaviness endure the night, yet joy shall come with break of day. She shudders with a strange delight, the fearful dream is passed away. She wakes, the grey dawn streaks the dark, With early song the copses ring, Far off she hears the watchdog bark, A joyful bark of welcoming. February the 23rd, 1857 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After Three Days by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Lucas I stood within the gate of a great temple, Mid the living stream of worshippers that thronged its regal state, Fair pictured in my dream. Jewels and gold were there, 
and floors of marble lent a crystal sheen to body forth as in a lower air the wonders of the scene such wild and lavish grace had whispers in it of a coming doom as richest flowers lie strown about the face of her that waits the tomb the wisest of the land had gathered there three solemn trysting days for high debate men stood on either hand to listen and to gaze the aged brows were bent bent to a frown half thought and half annoy that all their stores of subtlest argument were baffled by a boy in each averted face i marked but scorn and loathing till mine eyes fell upon one that stirred not in his place tranced in a dumb surprise surely within his mind strange thoughts are born until he doubts the lore of those old men blind leaders of the blind whose kingdom is no more surely he sees afar a day of death the stormy future brings the crimson setting of the herald star that led the eastern kings thus as a sunless deep mirrors the shining heights that crown the bay so did my soul create anew in sleep the picture seen by day gazers came and went a restless hum of voices marked the spot in varying shades of critic discontent prating they knew not what where is the comely limb the form attuned in every perfect part the beauty that we should desire in him ah fools and slow of heart look into those deep eyes deep as the grave and strong with love divine those tender pure and fathomless mysteries that seem to pierce through thine look into those deep eyes stirred to unrest by breath of coming strife until a longing in thy soul arise that this indeed were life that thou couldst find him there bend at his sacred feet thy willing knee and from thy heart pour out the passionate prayer lord let me follow thee but see the crowd divide mother and sire have found their lost one now the gentle voice that fain would seem to chide whispers son why hast thou in tone of sad amaze thus dealt with us that art our dearest thing behold thy sire and i three weary days have sought thee sorrowing and i had stayed to hear the loving words how is it that ye sought but that the sudden lark with matins clear severed the links of thought then over all there fell shadow and silence and my dream was fled as fade the phantoms of a wizard's cell when the dark charm is said yet in the gathering light i lay with half-shut eyes that would not wake lovingly clinging to the skirts of night for that sweet vision's sake february sixteenth eighteen sixty one end of poem this recording is in the public domain Faces in the Fire by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org The night creeps onward, sad and slow, And these red embers is dying glow, The forms of fancy come and go. An island farm, broad seas of corn, Stirred by the wandering breath of morn, The happy spot where I was born. The picture fadeth in its place, Amid the glow I seem to trace, The shifting semblance of a face. Tis now a little childish form, red lips for kisses pouted warm, and elf locks tangled in the storm. Tis now a grave and gentle maid, at her own beauty half afraid, shrinking and willing to be stayed. O oh, time was young and life was warm, when first I saw that fairy form, her dark hair tossing in the storm. And fast and free these pulses played, when last I met that gentle maid when last her hand in mine was laid. Those locks of jet are turned to grey, and she is strange and far away. They might have been mine own today. They might have been my own, my dear, through many and many a happy year. They might have sat beside me here. I, changeless through the changing scene, 
The ghostly whisper rings between, the dark refrain of might have been. The race is o'er, I might have run, the deeds are past, I might have done, and seer the wraith, I might have won. Sunk is the last faint flickering blaze, the vision of departed days is vanished even as I gaze. The pictures with their ruddy light are changed to dust and ashes white, and I am left alone with night. Written January 1860. End of poem. A Lesson in Latin by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug A Lesson in Latin Our Latin books in motley row Invite us to our task. Gay Horace, stately Cicero, Yet there's one verb, when once we know, No higher skill we ask. This ranks all other lore above. We've learned, amare means to love. So, hour by hour, from flower to flower, We sip the sweets of life, Till all too soon the clouds arise, And flaming cheeks and flashing eyes Proclaim the dawn of strife. With half a smile and half a sigh, Amare, bitter one, we cry. Last night we owned, with looks forlorn, Too well the scholar knows There is no rose without a thorn. But peace is made. We sing, this morn, No thorn without a rose. Our Latin lesson is complete. We've learned that love is bitter sweet. May, 1888 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Puck Lost and Found by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Lucas Puck has fled the haunts of men, Ridicule has made him wary, In the woods and down the glen No one meets a fairy. Cream, the greedy goblin cries, Empties the deserted dairy, Steals the spoons and off he flies, Still we seek our fairy. Ah, what form is entering, Lovelit eyes and laughter airy, Is not this a better thing, Child, whose visit thus I sing, Even than a fairy? November twenty second, 1891 Puck has ventured back again, Ridicule no more affrights him, In the very haunts of men, Newer sport delights him. Capering lightly to and fro, ever frolicking and funning, crack, the mimic pistols go, hark, the noise is stunning. All too soon will childhood gay realize life's sober sadness. Let's be merry while we may, innocent and happy fay, elves were made for gladness. November twenty fifth, eighteen ninety one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Song of Love by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Gabi A Song of Love Say, what is the spell when her fledglings are cheeping That lures the bird home to her nest? Or wakes the tired mother whose infant is weeping To cuddle and croon it to rest? What the magic that charms the glad babe in her arms Till it coos with the voice of the dove? Tis a secret, and so let us whisper it low, And the name of the secret is love. For I think it is love, for I feel it is love, For I'm sure it is nothing but love. Say, whence is the voice that, when anger is burning, Bids the whirl of the tempest to cease, That stirs the vexed soul with an aching, a yearning, For the brotherly hand-grip of peace? Whence the music that fills all our being, that thrills, Around us, beneath and above? Tis a secret, none knows how it comes, how it goes, but the name of the secret is love. 
for I think it is love, for I feel it is love, for I'm sure it is nothing but love. Say, whose is the skill that paints valley and hill, like a picture so fair to the sight, that flecks the green meadow with sunshine and shadow, till the little lambs sleep with delight? Tis a secret untold to hearts cruel and cold, though it is sung by the angels above, in notes that ring clear for the ears that can hear, and the name of the secret is love. For I think it is love, for I feel it is love, for I'm sure it is nothing but love. October 1886 End of poem this recording is in the public domain. End of Three Sunsets and Other Poems by Lewis Carroll